All right. We're here today with Matt Osmond. How are you doing, Matt? I'm very well. Young or Southpaw, whichever I should call you. Well, whichever, whichever you prefer. Mr. Southpaw, Southpaw. probably. Mr. Southpaw yeah. sounds civilized. Okay. Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you. Glad to hear it. So I want to talk to you about your novel, The Ruins. Oh, good, good. The word base and the yeah. word book each start with a B, each have four letters. Base has four strings. How much was all this on your mind while you were writing The Ruins? Well, I think, you know, like most people, I chose my profession from, you know, a, a, the Penguin Book of Professions. You know what I mean? And I just ran through, I had some kind of bass player. And um, after a couple of years when, you know, I, you know, bass playing was, was getting too small for me, I just went down the page a little further. And there was book writer. Um, next thing I think I'm going to be is, is, is a Bulgarian. So, I mean, that's, the, that, that's a career move to look forward to. This seems like it was all just set out for you. Fate. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm, I am going to work my way through, through all the bays. Nice. That sounds like a very fulfilling life. Yeah, yeah I think so. I think so. Yeah, I, I don't know where it ends, you know, in, in a by water somewhere, I suppose. In the Byzantine Empire. Oh, man, that's good. Yeah. I don't think you can go past that. Exactly. That's the end of the bees. And you've got those lovely Penguin editions behind you. That yeah, yeah. All, all my books are color-coded, which I think is a, a genuine sign of someone who doesn't actually read. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's books as a, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a decor more than anything. Oh, yeah, nice. I, do love an, I do love an orange book. They are nice, yeah. I, uh, hmm. Thing brown though, maybe keeping with the bees. I don't think you get a lot of brown books. I'm Parts, looking. At, yeah. I'm looking around now at my list. You know, white is is big. Blue seems to be popular, perhaps a bit eighties, but but not a lot of brown. I mean, perhaps that could be a an area for me to move into. The future is wide open. Yeah, brown, just brown books for people with for people with cream walls, I suppose. Yeah, and put them next to the orange. You got a nice autumnal thing going on. Yeah, a nice seventies look. Yeah, seventies Gucci. Yeah, I quite like it. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, the bass is usually like the anchor of the band. I mean, you've got you sit in with the groove, but you also have a melodic element going on. How did you find the process of writing as compared to making music? It's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a very strange thing, actually, the comparison. I mean, the great thing about making music is, is it's really collaborative. Mm. And, you know, I, I work, with, I work with, with guys who I've known, you know, in the case of Brett, most of my life. Um, so you're kind of brutally honest with each other. You know, if you make a mistake in, in the studio, you know, someone immediately just goes, oh, for fuck's sake. You know what I mean? Do that again. Or, you know, there's always someone kind of, you know, thinking about how you can do it better. Um, and that doesn't really happen in, in, in the book world. You know, if you make a mistake, you kind of double down on it over and over again until, you know, the whole book can hang on a terrible, terrible giant mistake. mistake. Yeah. And then, you know, kind of an editor says to you, oh, you know, did you realize, you know, this character says so and so when he shouldn't know it? And you're suddenly like, oh, right. So the last 400 pages will have to be redone. So it's, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, it's slightly terrifying writing a book because everything hangs on, on you getting stuff right. But at, at the same time, you know, it's, at, at least it's entirely yours. You know, I mean, I love being a bass player. I love the kind of uh, anonymity of it. But at the same time, you know, you get to a certain age where you kind of want to have something of your own. Mm. Yes, that, that is profound. And you... <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I don't think I've ever been called profound before. You see, your standards are, your standards are very low. Your standards of profundity. Even with the profoundness, on page 70, you mention expecting the bass player to be there snaffling the free sandwiches. I mean, how much of it all is just about sandwiches for you? It's, you know, I mean, not a huge amount. I'd say, 
65%, you know, I mean, when you get into it, you know, it's, yeah, it's girls and sandwiches, really, are, are, are the main thing. It's, it's one of the things about, about touring is that you get used to the idea of there being free food wherever you go. It's a real problem when I go on holiday because I'm used to, you know, the hotel having a breakfast that's paid for by the tour and the venues, especially European venues, Italian venues and Spanish venues, they have these amazing catering, you know, it's kind of massive paellas and loads of booze and stuff like that. Um, and it's turned me into the world's kind of meanest man. Because, you know, I go on holiday and I'm there with my scrambled eggs and smoked salmon and someone turns up and says, you know, that'll be $40. And I'm, I'm just looking around for, for you know, where, where, where's the tour manager to sort this out? So, yeah, you know, the free, the free food is, is, is a real bonus. I know when bands get older, Neil from the Pet Shop Boys was saying that they basically, you know, they base their tours around good restaurants now. It's one of the reasons why they go on quite early, even though they do this quite clubby music. They're off by 10 and they're in a nice restaurant by 11 that with lights and manana. That seems to be way to live, really. That, I mean, that's, I, I, I could go for that right now, you know, dinner with Liza. Yeah. Where would you go? What are some of your well, favorite restaurants? Oh, God. Um, well, I'd take her for a curry, I think. You know what I mean? I mean, one of the things that, I yield to no man in uh, my admiration for American cuisine. Um, but you can't do Indian food. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing. And if I ever spend a lot of time in the States, th there comes a point where I have to have proper Indian food. Um, so I'd take Liza, you know, I'd say, whatever you've been eating when you've been out to Indian food in the States, it's not right. This is how it should be. It should be swimming, swimming in fat, and it should be kind of bright orange, unidentifiable matter in the middle of it, and it should be hotter than the sun, and that's that's all you need. So yeah, I take her to the Cannes Tandoori on, on my street and, and treat her to, to some poppadoms and a prawn danzac. Wow. I, I hesitate to even bring this up, but uh, how do you feel about Americans making tea? Um, well, you just can't, to be honest. I mean, I mean, it's something that we've been training for in Britain from, from, from birth, you know what I mean? You know, most, I think most children, the first, the first thing they're taught by their parents is, you know, potty training, and then the importance of, of warming the, 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 the jug and the cups before you pour your tea, you know, I mean, the kind of ritual element of it and the importance of certain temperatures and you know you have a different temperature for black tea and green tea and all these kind of things uh, sure. just don't even bother you know what i mean i i wouldn't i wouldn't try well i was in canada recently and they have a, a drink called the london fog which they sell in in every coffee shop um which is an earl grey tea latte with sugar and it's just like most American drinks, North American drinks, it's basically a dessert that's been put into a coffee cup. And I had to keep saying to them, this isn't a London thing. If you, if you were to serve this to a Londoner, they'd throw you out, you know what I mean? And they were like, no, 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 London fog, you know, it's kind of, it's a cool thing. So yeah, the, you know, don't try curry, don't try tea, don't try Marmite, but everything else, you know, I mean, I love a bit of American food. I, I do like the portion sizes. Too, too big is, is, is the perfect portion size. It is, it is quite crazy over here, yeah. It um, is, yeah. Whew. The sandwiches thing is more profound than I thought it would be. Exactly. Well, you know, I, th I think a lot about food. You know, I mean, one of the things about touring is there's a lot of hanging around. I used to do a thing on, on, on Twitter and Instagram, um, which for all my interesting content that I provide, it's easily the most popular thing I've ever put on social media, which is Rider Watch, which is just basically 
me tweeting a picture of whichever odd crisps we've been served in in Europe because as soon as you get into Europe they're just there's a free for all on on flavors of crisps cucumber crisps this is chips to, to America yes. <laughs> cucumber flavored uh, uh, chips gazpacho chips uh, paprika obviously is huge all over, all over Europe um, but the, yeah, they'll just go for it. They'll go for anything, you know. My favourite that I ever had was in uh, Denmark, where they had baked potato flavoured chips, which were just majestic. They were just they, they, they tasted like chips that had been buttered, which is you know is a, is a, I think a million dollar idea anyway. I'm I'm in awe. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that that's trademarked, by the way. Don't oh. don't think you can you can do that. That's my that's my retirement plan. <laughs> One of my favorite things I've heard about Denmark as well is you familiar with the film uh, Dracula A.D. nineteen seventy two, Christopher Lee film. No, but I love Christopher Lee. He's he a, comes, a huge favorite of mine. Yeah, he comes back into you know swing in London basically maybe a few years after, but the uh, the Danish translation of this when translated back into English is just Dracula chases hot pants. Nice. Yeah. I mean, you, you know what you're getting there, don't you? I mean, that's the best, that's the best thing. It's, uh, it's, it, 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 it does what it says on the tin, as we say over here. I see, going to see that at the cinema, eating some baked potato flavored chips. It sounds fantastic. Yeah, no, um, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, who I'm a huge fan of both. Um, they used to go to comedy movies together. They were kind of connoisseurs of, of, of comedy uh, movies. And the two of them would just sit at the back laughing up, uproariously all the way through. They apparently fought about who could get onto the Muppets first, because both of them were absolutely obsessed with the Muppets and the Muppet movies. And there's fantastic clips of Christopher Lee with Kermit that are just absolutely great. I'm going to have to check those out. Oh, no, it's, it, it's, it's really... And Vincent Price as well. I love I love all those that, those kind of like English horror guys. It's 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 that that's another thing I'd like to do in my retirement. Be a kind of urbane a vampire actor. I could see it. Yeah, no, I've got the I've got the hairline for it. <laughs> I just watched uh, I've I've been watching a Diana Rigg film every night. I just watched Theater of Blood the other night with uh, Vincent oh, Price. Fantastic, yeah. And I guess yeah, I mean that's some proper scenery chewing for acting there. Yeah. No, he's great. And I guess I have the great Muppet caper on the list as well, if I'm going to do them all. <laughs> I, I mean, I took, I took my nieces to see um, the Muppet's Christmas Carol uh, a couple of years ago. And it's really interesting because, I, I, I mean, I love Dickens. Um, it's about the most faithful version of a Christmas Carol there is. Because it's a story that's been told so many times, everyone now kind of messes with it a little bit and messes with the timeline and stuff. And weirdly, although the Muppets has, you know, pigs and rats and frogs as the main character, in terms of the story, it's just, it's, it's pure, it's pure Dickens. I, th I think they've done the best version of it. I, th I think Charles Dickens would approve. I wonder if that's what he had in mind in the first place, but it was just too yeah, out there. He probably did, and then he was just like, no one's going to buy it if I put a frog in as, as Bob Cratchit. So, you know, I'll just, I'll just keep it as humans for now. Yeah, no, that's probably exactly what happened. When he turned up to his agent, I've got a brilliant idea. There's this kind of brassy female pig as one of the main characters. That's the public. And his agent's just like, Charles, you know what your public likes, you know what I mean? Ah! <sighs> What might have been, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the word suede appears a couple times in the book. Let's get back to your book. Mm -hmm. How did you feel writing it, typing it out? Um, I didn't realize it did, actually. I'm thinking about it. Originally, I had a couple of real digs at, at, at suede in there. Because because he was because the the main character Brandon was was kind of from the same time as us and he's kind of like a failed failed rock star from from Camden. Um, I knew he'd hate us, so originally 
it was kind of full of these little digs at Suede. And then about halfway through, I was just like, it's too clever, clever. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's too having your cake and, it, and eating it. Um, but yeah, I suppose, oh yeah, someone, wear, someone wears a suede shirt, don't they, at some point. I've become, I've become blind to, to the word, to be honest. It, it's kind of, it's, it's one of those weird things. It's, it's, it's like your own name, you know what I mean? It's, you don't notice it anymore. Well, if you're called, or, you know, if, if you're called uh, Southpaw, then probably you do notice it, you know, it's, but, but maths, you know, it turns up all the time, it's way. There's a, a, a hairdresser's in LA, in Silver Lake, actually, called Southpaw, whenever I walk by it. I just, yeah. Nice. My fa my fa Britain and London especially is renowned for, for kind of um, uh, punning names for, for hairdressers, you know, curl up and die, or uh, a cut above the rest, those kind of things. And there used to be one around the corner that, that me and Neil were obsessed with, because it had started with a really bad pun, spit and panache. And then it had been called something else and the sign had a kind of hole in the middle and it had been put back in. So you w went past the shop that was called Spit and Incorporating Panache. And I was just like, this is, this is, this is a full album title. <laughs> You know, as a, as a hairdresser, it's absolutely great. And it's, it's gone now. It's now it's called something much more sensible, like the hairdressers. Oh. But um, always spit and incorporating a panache. I love it. If, if I ever do a full kind of uh, tribute band, which I probably will, that's, that's going to be the first, the first album. They should be in your vampire films. Exactly. Well, yeah. That'd be, I mean, Marky Smith definitely has the look of someone who doesn't spend a lot of uh, time in daylight so. yeah, yeah. my favorite probably my favorite name ever um, is on the old kent road there's a chinese restaurant just called uncle wrinkles chinese <laughs> restaurant and, and i just can't even fathom what the history might be yeah that's uh, that's that, that, that's quite odd there's there's a famous uh, chinese restaurant on um the old Kent Road with, with notoriously the worst Elvis impersonator in the whole world, who apparently doesn't look or sound like Elvis, you know. It's only because it says on the sign on the door, Elvis impersonator tonight, that you have any idea that that's what he's supposed to. Otherwise you just think, oh God, some drunks got up and, and, started, and started singing. I gotta see this. I mean, Burning Love is my go-to uh, karaoke tune. Oh, right. Well, great, great. You, I mean, you, you'd probably shame him, you know, <laughs> if, if you were to come there. Ooh. What, that, that, mind blown. <laughs> the old Kent yeah, Road. Well, Chinese it, restaurant. Next time you're on the old Kent Road, look out for it. Someone needs to write a history of the Chinese restaurants on the old Kent Road, I think. It would be, uh, that, that's pretty niche. Yeah, I can see that might be on par with Dickens pitching the pig to. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. When did the title "The Ruins" come to you? Um, I don't think yeah, titles are, are really, really hard to be honest. Um, you want something. It, it's really hard to describe. You want something that gives an angle on the book without explaining the book. Mm. Uh, I have these discussions a lot with Brett about like, about album covers and titles and stuff, and the. They need to be a kind of way of looking at it. So there's lots of, you know, the people in the book are kind of ruined and it's a lot about the city, London, the ruins of, of London being built up and, and all those kind of things. But at the end of the day, it sounded good. It cropped up in the book and it looked good on a poster. I mean, this is one of the, one of the reasons we're called Suede and not something longer. It was always like, you know, if you call yourself something small, you look bigger on the poster and it always looks like you're higher up the bell. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're called kind of the teardrop explodes, you're always like this line in the middle. So, you know, I mean, X is, is the best band name of all time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you're just, you know, it's just there. You can't get smaller than that. Wow. Exactly. Or well, I, I, I suppose you could, be, you could be just like a comma or something. Yeah, punctuation seems to be creeping in. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want punctuation on the band title, do you? That's really, that's really too much. 
that's that, that's when you that, that's when you know it's gone too far. Yeah, yeah. Who had a song about an Oxford comma? It was Vampire Weekend, wasn't it? Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's that, that that's that's too geeky even for me. I think. <laughs> you know, what I mean, there are certain things that that are not the purview of of rock and roll music. Yeah. I, I think the correct use of a comma would fall into the, the kind of things that you could write a book about, but please, not, not a song. I guess that's the new punk rock, you know. The yeah, rebellion punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> punctuation is the new punk rock. Give me 500 words on that. Oh. <laughs> so The Bruins is set in 2010, and I'm curious why you chose that year, because 2010 is the sequel to 2001 a space oddity and as far as i can tell no part of your book takes place in outer space let me correct me if i'm wrong um i'm not going to correct you because you're not wrong <laughs> there's mention of the voyager space spacecraft at, at one point and so there's a, a mention of, of outer space but um but no no it, everyone is is breathing god's god's air on god's green earth in the book uh, the reason it sat then was I was I was working on a, a very strange project, a kind of live action TV show come theatre project uh, called The Conspiracy for Good with uh, a guy called Tim Crean, who's the guy who wrote Heroes, that TV show. Okay. And he came over to London and we were working on this project together. And then we had the Icelandic earthquakes, uh, the, not earthquakes, volcanoes, and everyone was trapped here. And it was this really weird time when no one could really do anything and everyone was forced to kind of make stuff. And, and you know, instead of having endless meetings and flying back and forth, they actually sat and wrote, you know. And at the time I thought, there is never going to be a situation more bizarre and where people feel more trapped than a few planes being cancelled in, in, in 2010. And then, you know, the book comes out and suddenly the entire world is, is locked down. So um, I'm claiming it as a kind of, you know, prefiguration of the times, you know, and, and you should obviously run out and buy the ruins because, you know, it tells you something about these straightened times. Your listeners can't see that my fingers are crossed as, <laughs> as I'm saying that. Dang, the conspiracy for good. I, I, someone mentioned that recently, like with everything flying around <laughs> the internet. It was, like it, was a, it was an absolutely insane project. It really was. The main people doing it were these, these, uh, these Swedish LARPers. You know LARPers? No. Live, Live action, action role playing. Yeah, wow. These guys were absolutely nuts i mean they finished this huge project where they kind of lived as hobos and spies for, for eight weeks and then they went home and for, for fun um they did this larp which was set in a quarry in northern sweden where half of them were were kind of um guards and half of them were slaves so they paid their kind of 5,000 kroner and half of them spent the time literally breaking rocks while while their friends shouted at them and they did this for play they were they were genuine that they're a lovely lovely bunch they're they're all absolutely nuts the the thing that the first time I met one of them a guy called Martin Erickson who runs lots of lots of big um insane laughing projects he said the most Swedish thing anyone has ever said to me. He was talking about um, uh, medieval week in Sweden, which is like the Renaissance fairs in, in America, but taken incredibly seriously. You know what I mean? These people, you know, they plan for weeks and they live in, in totally medieval times. And he said to me, I was saying, was it fun? And he said, ah, the thing is, I was... At one point, I was having a threesome in the open air, and I looked down, and this girl had dyed her pubic hair blue, 
And all I could think is, that's anachronistic. <laughs> and, you know, he kind of said it to me and I was just like, okay, fine. I, I have a handle now on, on the way your mind works. Um, but yeah, I spent a lot of time with, with those guys and, and uh, they're absolutely fantastic. One of them is now a full-time Harry Potter wizard at one of the Harry Potter worlds. One of them lives as a vampire and the rest of them, God knows where they are, in some cave somewhere. Lovely vampire, guys. we've got the cast, building up the cast. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, there's vampires everywhere you look. I didn't realize, but I keep coming back to them. The, uh, speaking of threesomes, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Adam and Brandon are twins. It's like, I was wondering how familiar, not in a naughty way, but how familiar <laughs> are, you with, are you with twins? Um, I'm, my, my nieces are twins. Oh. Um, I've got two, two nieces who are, who are 10 years old and they're twins. Um, and yeah, they were, they were a total inspiration for the book in a way, because what's fascinating about them is that they're really similar but you have to kind of um, you have to kind of play them off each other. You have to have them as, as oppositional to understand them. So one's the quiet one, and one's the noisy one. One's the academic one, and one's the sporty one. And you do these things, and in terms of the whole world, they're both noisy and they're both academic. But just because it's the way the human mind works, you kind of force. Hello. What's going on? <laughs> well, yeah, I have, to, I have twin, twin nieces who are both 10 years old and they're a total inspiration for it because there's this, this strange process that because, um, because they're really similar, the little differences between them become really important. And you find yourself saying, um, okay, so she's the sporty one, she's the academic one. Or, She's the noise one, she's the quiet one. And on the, the curve of human beings, they sit in the same place. But you almost force them um, to where their badges of difference. And I thought it was really interesting to, you know, the, the, the two characters, the two brothers, when they start off, you think, oh my God, they're, they're completely opposite. One's bookish and quiet, and one's this kind of, you know, extravagant, outgoing kind of uh, musician. Um, but as you get, further into it you suddenly realize that at their heart they're really similar they're really they're, they want to control their world they want to be in charge of their world they've just chosen very different ways of doing it so um so you know that that that, that was a total inspiration for it i always remember one of the funniest things that brett the singer from the band ever said we were in a uh, a meeting in New York, it's when the band had, had uh, we started getting attention from American record companies and we got taken out by this big nameless record company. And we went for dinner, it was a big posh dinner. And we were kind of stuck with, with the lawyers and, and people like that. And, um, and we, were talk, we, were to, we were talking to this lawyer and she said to Brett, oh, I've only been, I've only been uh, back at the company for a couple of, couple of months and I just had twins and there was this absolute silence and Brett just went oh really it's always been a fantasy of mine and then there was this, this absolute silence <laughs> and then everyone at the table just obviously agreed to just never speak of it again um, but we didn't sign with them so it's fine anyway that's that's a, a digression but it made me laugh at the time and I'm so, I'm so going to steal it and, and stick it in a book at some point. Nice, nice. Now, in the book as well, like London and Los Angeles are twinned. Like, how yeah. familiar are you with LA? I love LA. I go there a lot. I got, I got married in LA. Ah. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I spend a lot of time there. And I always think that that London and LA are kind of as different cities as you can possibly get you know i kind of i love new york as well but in a way there's no point going there if you're from london you know it's it's like london with 
with better Chinese food, you know, it's, it's just, it's virtually the same, you know what I mean? The, the kind of, the emphasis is the same. But LA is the, is the anti-London, you know what I mean? It has no centre, the weather's always good, you can't walk anywhere. I mean, London is, is the ultimate walking city. You know, it's, it's straight lines, all these kind of weird things. And London is, is you know, you, you need to be kind of like a, uh, a magician to even, you know, uh, find your way around. So I go to LA a lot as a, as a um, almost like a, an antidote to, to London. I, you know, I don't know whether I could live in LA. I think it would drive me mad. Yeah, but I do, I do, I do love that. I, I, I kind of love the fact that, that you can be, you know, you can go from this urban centre to the beach or to the desert or to the forest or to the mountains in like an hour. Yeah. It just, it seems absolutely nuts. I mean, British people are always really sniffy about Americans not having passports. You know, some of them, you know, 40% of Americans have passports and 98% of Brits have passports. But, you know, when I come to somewhere like LA, I'm like, I kind of understand it. You know, it's, you have all the things that I would have to fly five hours, you know, just around the corner. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, 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 the, it's the most opposite city to London and it's, it's a good palate cleanser for coming back here. Something I thought was cool in the book was that you mentioned some bands that I hadn't heard of before. I, I didn't know the nymphs and imitating angels. Um, the nymphs. The nymphs are renowned for for um, when we were to, when we were trying to sign um, an American label. Geffen um, had had just signed them, and the lead singer is renowned for squatting on Tom Zutat's desk and, and peeing all over it. And in some kind of, in some kind of protest again, I can't even remember what it was a protest. He told us this kind of like, just absolutely shocked. And um, it's it's one of my, my one of my best memories of the first time we went there. It's actually it's a banger that single, Imitating Angels. Everything else they did is terrible. But it's a great it's it's a, it's a great great record, a great LA record. Um, but yeah, it totally reminds me of, of that. You, you know, a, a lot of the record is about um, that, the, you know, that, that weird feeling. There's a link between LA and, and Britain and it's, it's, LA always got British music. We always felt incredibly at home there. You know what I mean? I always found it so strange. You'd go over there and people were like insane about The Cure and Depeche Mode and all these bands that felt so, so British. And it all, it almost felt like it was a little offshoot. Um, so yeah, you know, there's a little bit of, of memory of kind of, you know, shopping in Amoeba Records and, and you, know, you know, playing the Roxy and things like that. Just that kind of the, the tunnel between London and LA. How do you feel about American rock? Do you but American rock? Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, some of my favorite records of, of all time of American rock, you know, uh, okay. Iggy Pop's The Idiot, Patti Smith's Horses, uh, Television, Marky Moon, um, you know, so, so much of, of, of the records that, that I loved when I was growing up were, were, were American, you know, Velvet Underground were, were really important to me and Brett when we started because we could play their songs. You know what I mean? It was, it was kind of absolutely, you know, because we were listening to like the Smiths and people like that. But, you know, Johnny Mouse was a fucking genius and hard to rip off. And then, you know, we found things like the Velvet Underground that you're kind of like, oh, we can do this. Even I can play this, you know what I mean? Um, so I don't know, it was always strange. We were always set up a little bit in, in opposition to, to American music. But um, yeah, I'm, I, I, it, it's kind of half and half my record collection, I would say, pretty much. Half American, half German, you know, nothing in between. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, like, with uh, Kimmy's voice box and the models in the book, I mean, how much is this a tribute to Kraftwerk? Um, it's definitely stolen a little bit from it. You know, I mean, Kraftwerk are, 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 are absolute heroes of mine. Uh, when we were talking beforehand, 
I, I went to see them, I saw them in Mexico City a couple of years ago. And I was really disappointed that it was actually them. It's, it's so weird because with most bands, it's like, you want to see the guys. You know what I mean? That's, kind of, that, that, that's the thing, you know, you, you know, you go and see the Stones, you want to see the fucking Stones. But um, with Kraftwerk, it was like, send the robots. You know what I mean? It's, it's all sequenced. It's all, you know, it's all button press. I'd love it if the robots were up there doing their kind of movements. And, you know, the, and Florian and Ralph were, were, were back at home just, you know, tapping buttons. I love that. I mean, the thing, have you, uh, have you seen Kraftwerk recently? Uh, last time I saw him was in 98 in New York. Okay, they are, well, you know, I mean, the 60, 70 year old men, um, but they're wearing the Lycra body suits with LEDs on. And it's, it's, it's not attractive. It's like, it's, it's like you know, it's, it's like the Tron old people's home. And it's, you just, it's, it's like, send the, yeah, I love the robots. You know, it's kind of like, I would have loved to have seen them, you know. And I, I like to think of the guys back at home and, you know, in Dusseldorf, you know, perhaps, you know, watching the Tour de France while they just tap a button and queue up the next song. I'm, I'm fine with that. They've earned it, you know. Yeah. I wish we'd done it, you know. I, I, I still think, I still think the bands that do that, you know, Slipknot, it's kind of, it's absolute fucking genius. You know, it's it's almost like there was one genius among them who went, look, I know it seems like we're just kind of like a, a metal band, a silly metal band, and this will be over in a couple of years. But maybe we'll still be doing it when we're 60. And it'd be really nice to be able to send someone out in our place and sit at home and play pool. You know, it, just go with me, guys. You know, and the mask, it's going to be sweaty but I promise you it's going to be worth it in the end. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, you know, that's what I would go back and, and say to my 20-year-old self. Always wear a mask. <laughs> and look, the timing's the timing proved perfect, you know. It's, it's, it's a message for our times. All about the prophecies. Exactly, yeah. It's all about the masks. How much do you share Brandon's uh, fascination with the occult? I think he's mentioned John Dee in the book. And... Um... It's, it, you know what, it's, it's, it's really strange. I, I was fascinated by all that stuff when I was younger, hmm. uh, both like horoscopes and, and, and all those kind of things. And then uh, when I got to kind of 13, 14, I became an insane skeptic. And, I, and still I am now, you know what I mean? It, it's all nonsense. You know, I, I don't believe in the supernatural. I don't believe in uh, ghosts. I don't believe in magic in that sense or any of those things but as I get older I'm more and more interested in it's really difficult to talk about this without so many pretensions but I'm going to try I'm really interested in what we use those things for what do we use horoscopes and I love tarot cards you know I think that I think they're absolutely fascinating what do we use them for and we use them to, to kind of reach into our unconscious. Yeah. You know what I mean? We use them, they come out with these vague messages and you end up taking from it what you would have taken from anything. It almost doesn't matter what you do it with, but it's a way of sparking your unconscious. And I'm much more... Nowadays, I'm much more, you know, I, I'll, 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 um, I'll lay out a tarot hand for myself before I write something sometimes and oh, wow. just let it just point me in a certain direction. And I think the other thing is it's, and this is going to sound pretentious, but I think it's really, really hard to spend your life making music and not believe a little bit in magic. You know what I mean? I, I still, every now and then, when we're recording something and we go into a room with these planks of words and a couple of words, and at the end of it, you have something that, that changes your mood and changes your life and how you look at the world, that there's something, there's something magical about that. You know what I mean? And 
that sense that, that we're trying, that we're all trying to find those, those, those things that are unexplainable is, is I don't know, I, I have much more time for it nowadays. I still, you know, I still think it's all nonsense if you think it's actually telling you the truth. But I, I do believe you can learn a lot about yourself from, from kind of almost just going with it. It almost doesn't matter what it is, you know what I mean? One of the things I find with writing is um, if, you, if you're in the situation where you, 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 know, you think, I'm not in the mood for writing today, I, you know, just write anything. It, doesn't, it really doesn't matter. Some, and something will appear, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's never time wasted. It's the same with music, you know what I mean? If, if I'm really stuck with music, I'll just try and copy something that I can't copy because you just, you just need starting points. Yeah. And like, I mean, so many great works of art have come from people with a fascination of the occult, but again, it is that tapping into some aspect of yourself. A, totally, totally. But, but it's also, you know, it, it's, it's trying, it's trying to, it's trying to find the unconscious, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's trying to find, especially if you work in a, you know, as most of us do now in, um, in kind of places where there's incredible sets of rules and, you know, you, you're doing what you're told and you're doing, you're doing, someone else could do the job as well as you, you know, that kind of really depressing thing. Then you want a moment of, of the unexpected, you know what I mean? You almost have to kind of force the unexpected upon yourself. I've got, I'm, I'm slightly obsessed with, with this, this study they did in America, which was they left people in a room with nothing in it apart from a button and a box that was that was wired up to your hand and it gave you an electric shock and you were just in there for an hour and everyone ends up just repeatedly pressing the button and giving themselves electric shocks and you're like but why it hurts and it's because we'd rather have something new and something unexpected than nothing you know it, it doesn't really matter what it is or whether it's any good I, I think about this all the time because it says something really profound and probably quite depressing about human nature really but you know i often think it when i'm sitting writing you know i'm just sitting and pressing that fucking button <laughs> <laughs> now Ian Rankin, in his review of the book, uh, said there's a touch of pinching about it. Um, so I was wondering, who, who were some of your favorite authors? What, what books? I mean, I love Pynchon, and I'm incredibly, incredibly flattered by that. You know, it's kind of, to have a writer who I love, Ian Rankin, compare me to another writer who I love is, you know, it's, it's a good double whammy. Um, who do I love? There's a guy called Michelle Faber, who I really love. He wrote a book called Under the Skin, which is like a, a weird sci-fi thing that got made into a, a really good movie, actually, with, um, I can't remember her name. There's a bit, Jonathan, Jonathan Glazer did it. Very odd. It's about a, a kind of alien who kills hitchhikers. It's done really um, kind of matter of fact. And then he wrote a huge Victorian novel for his next thing. He's one of these people who just, I love people who, who kind of flip between genres and don't really sit anywhere uh, not, I, normal. I like Michael Chabon a lot. A lot. Okay. You know what I mean? I love the fact that he went from The Wonder Boys, which is, you know, this great little kind of tableau of, of, of fucked American life, to then Cavalier and Clay, which is this, you know, the, huge history of comic books and this. I, I love people who are, are just, you know, they just kind of overflow from with ideas. But you know, I'm weirdly, uh, British radio is running these incredible adaptations of the Sherlock Holmes books, like all 77 of them. And I'm listening to them again and remembering that they were my favourite, favourite things when I was growing up. And I still absolutely love them. You know, it's, 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 they're, they're, they're so clever. Um, 
but but they just have this this every now and then there's just this line that's so kind of grotesque and victorian i just love it i was listening to the the hound of the baskervilles and i've I, you know I've, I've i've read it many times but there's just a bit where uh, where, where holmes asks what somebody's seen and he says it was the footprints of a gigantic hound and it still gives me chills now i love it so a lot of that stuff you know i mean I know I should be saying more, um, more kind of literary writers, but yeah, I loved uh, Conan Doyle when I was growing up. I loved the James Bond books when I was growing up. Oh, yeah, me too. You know, I think I think Ian Fleming is a, is a, I think he's a hugely underrated writer, and he said my favourite thing about about writing. One of the things when you write a book is people send you. Um, what authors have said about writing and how you should write. And it's almost always terrible. And it always, always makes you feel, feel terrible, you know, cause it's all about, um, it's all about just, you know, kind of, it has to come from deep in the soul. You know what I mean? You have to leave every last, you know, drop of your blood on the page. And, uh, and Ian Fleming said, what you should do is have a villa by the sea and sit for six weeks writing every single day. Don't change a word and find a really good editor. And I was kind of like, ah, oh, yeah. He also said, and I absolutely love this, you know, someone said to him, you know, how do you decide your plots? And he said, I like to write things that are really unlikely, but not impossible. And that's, you know, that, that, I, if I could sum up what I like from a book, it's that. I love yeah. things that are kind of like on the verge of being impossible. But, you know, I love people like, I love science fiction writers, people like William Gibson. And I love that just on the edge of, of kind of, of what might happen. Wow. That, that is really good. What's your favorite Bond book? Oh, um, You Only Live Twice. Okay. You Only Live Twice is, do you remember it? Do you remember the book? Yes. Uh, so yeah. the plot is, but I mean, we all have, have come to think of Bond books as, you know, having super villains and, 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 you know, they're all trying to blow up the world, but, but it, Blofeld is, is the baddie in that. Shatterhand, right? Does he change yeah. his identity? Well, yeah. And, and, and what he's doing is he's built an island, which is full of sulfurous pools, poisonous animals and toxic plants so that people can commit suicide. And it's such a tiny little thing. And the, the, the funny thing is, if someone else had written that book, if, if, if you take out a lot of the Bond stuff, some, some of the action, it's, it's like a kind of, it's like Thomas Mann or something. You know what I mean? It's, it's like this weird European novel about a man who built a suicide garden and then this, 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 you know, this guy comes along who's lost his memory and is working as a pearl diver and via Vladivostok, you know, it's, it's just, it's a really, really interesting book. And, you know, because we know the, 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 the films, you know, it, it, it's kind of like, I think a lot of the, the genuine strangeness of, of some of the stuff he wrote is, is missing. Yeah, yeah, it's weird thinking about how the films sort of affect how we think. Because Moonraker, I think, is a fantastic book. It's, I think it's the only one he doesn't leave England. And Gala Brand, the female lead, is just as important part of yeah, the, yeah, solving yeah. it as Bond is. Whereas the film it's, is not that. Is, is Moonraker the, the, front, the one where um, he gets locked in the sauna at the beginning? He goes, he goes, he gets forced on this health cure and... Oh yeah, there's a couple like that, aren't there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I also, I just love his kind of lifestyle. I think that's the other thing, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of, it's, it's far more brutal than, than, than in the films and far less glamorous, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. And he gets, he eats a lot... <laughs> Sorry, someone was, there's actually a podcast about uh, James Bond and... Um, they were talking about uh, things that crop up all the time in all of the books, you know what I mean? 
uh, and someone pointed out that uh, he eats scrambled eggs more times than he drinks a martini in all the books. <laughs> He's obsessed with scrambled eggs. No one ever says it. No one, you know, they, they never brought this through to the, they never brought this through to the films. You know, it's, it's not his favorite line. You know, I'll have my eggs, you know, scrambled, not stirred. There you go, that's a piece of useless information for you. Someone just sent me a link, uh, some medical study did, as their, for their Christmas magazine did a study of uh, how much he actually drinks. And it's like oh. 92 units a week. <laughs> nice. And the only days he isn't drinking is when he's held captive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, they should at least they should at least give him a, a martini for the DTs, shouldn't they? When he's being uh, when he's being tied up. And some scrambled eggs. And some scr and obviously Apparently. some scrambled eggs. Yeah. So you're working on your second novel now. I am. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of deeply in it, but not sure whether. I've taken the wrong turn at some point, so it's 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 it's, it, it's either almost finished or just started. <laughs> it's, it's, well, yeah. Is there yeah. anything about the uh, difficult second album syndrome about doing it? Oh yeah, totally. You know, I mean, the, the, the first book is is very much you know the characters of me. You know, the the who I would be if I if I'd been a singer rather than a bass player. Uh, and who who I would be if I'd never had to work, you know what I mean? It's 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 kind of they're just you know there, but for the grace of God, go on. Um, but I kind of wanted to write something that was entirely out of my comfort zone, thinking that I could. <laughs> so so it's a book about it's a book about uh, Elizabethan child actors. So it's um, it's. It, it's it's a long way away. It, it, it's actually fascinating that there was a there's a troupe of of child actors, you know, kind of teenagers, called the Blackfriars Boys in 1600, 1602 around there, who acted in these incredibly political, really sexual plays, and you know, it, it was kind of it was the done thing to go and see them. You know what I mean? It's it's, it's quite extreme, you know, and they were kind of. Um, they were banned and it kind of fermented rebellion and apprentices rebellion. Um, but the, the, in a weird way, they're like a kind of like really early rock stars, you know what I mean? They're, they're kind of despised as being lower than whores and at the same time kind of worshipped by, by the kind of street kids and stuff. So they, they just appeal to me, but it's, it's hard work. And I've given up on doing any kind of um, research or using the historical language. <laughs> that's, that's the thing I can't stand. You know, it, once a forsooth creeps in there, it's like, fuck it, I'm not interested in you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, that. That's all my questions. You got anything coming up you want to add or? Plug or anything. Uh, have I got anything coming up? No, I mean it's it's. This is the longest that, that Swade of, I think have, have gone without playing a gig. Oh wow! While well, we've been together, you know, it's it's. We're waiting to play. I'm waiting to finish my book. Um, I'm I'm like everyone else at the moment. You know, I'm sitting at home listening to a lot of records, watching a lot of Netflix and drinking a lot of gin. And, and that is just going to go on until kind of summer next year. And unless I just discover a vaccine for myself, you know, I'm thinking <laughs> I'm, it's got to the point I'm thinking that's it. I'm just going to get a medical degree and, and get this thing sorted. It, how, how hard can it be? Eh? <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me, Mr. Southpaw.